stop your mic at the, uh, for now. Okay. And then I'll hand over to you shortly. Yeah, I'm waiting for the queue. Yes, Hazel, go ahead. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so, so, so much for joining our webinar session today, being the 1st of December as we commemorate the 2021 World AIDS Day. My name is Hazel Langa. I'm the acting director responsible for university relations here at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. I've been given the, a pleasant task to deliver the welcome address on behalf of the executive director of corporate relations, Ms. Noma Zondo, who is not able to join us because of an agent matter that she's dealing with. I would like to start by extending a very warm welcome to our esteemed panel comprising of uh, Professor Busisiwe Ngama, the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Health Sciences here at UKZ10. Prof Ngama will also facilitate the proceedings uh, this afternoon. We also have our colleague from our sister university, uh, Professor Refilwe Paswana Mafuya. Professor Paswana Mafuya is a professor of epidemiology and public health in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Johannesburg. It's good to have you. Thank you for joining okay. us. Thank you. We have also Ms. Felicita Hakim, who is the director at the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa. Welcome, Ms. Felicita. Thank you. We, we also have our alumnus, oh, Mr. Anele Mkila. Anele, thank you, thank you so much for making yourself available. Greetings uh, to all colleagues, students, our alumni, and members of the media. I welcome you to our webinar session in commemoration of the 2021 World AIDS Day. So in line with the UN AIDS 2021 urgent quest to end inequalities and AIDS and pandemics, our webinar is appropriately themed, ending, our webinar is appropriately themed, ending the HIV epidemic, equitable access, everyone's voice. If you look back 40 years ago, when the first cases of AIDS were reported, great strides have been achieved in the fight against AIDS. Statistics provided by the UN AIDS show that by June 2021, just over 28 million people had access to HIV treatment when compared to just under 8 million who had access to treatment in 2010. So quite a lot of work has been done. Our scientists have done amazing work developing various interventions and strategies to curb infections and fight the pandemic. However, our efforts tend to be overtaken by other plagues like the current COVID-19 pandemic. In South Africa, for example, we are at the verge of entering the fourth wave of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, these things do distract us. The other challenge is that in many African states and developing countries such as ours, we also have to deal with weaker health care systems corruption, overcrowded cities, the poor economic outlook, amongst many other social ills. This means that vulnerable communities remain marginalized due to inequalities and in access to resources, which is often determined by one's wealth. This also then derails our global mission to end the epidemic by 2030. That is why then it is important for us as a university to continue engaging various key stakeholders and communities on ways to address the global pandemic of HIV and AIDS as we are doing through this webinar. On a positive note though, I'm happy to report that as a caring university, we are also playing our part in the fight against AIDS through the work done by our students and researchers in our centers of excellence, including the Center for AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, known as CAPRISA. Another example is that earlier this year, our Vice Chancellor, working with researchers from the Health Economics and HIV AIDS Research Division, known as HERD, as well as the interdisciplinary team of local and international researchers, contributed to knowledge generation around the area of HIV when they launched a book titled Preventing HIV Among Young People in Southern and Eastern Africa, 
emerging evidence and intervention strategies. It was well received by the community um, researching in the area of HIV and AIDS. So if you are interested in finding out more about this, um, the, the, the information that uh, they, they was put together by these colleagues, please visit head.org.za to access this book. Also within our campuses, we have interventions such as the HIV and AIDS program, which is managed by the UK's Attain Disability Support Unit. Our HIV and AIDS program focuses on delivering a quality service and support to students who may be affected or infected by HIV. So this again shows that UK is working hard and also cares about its community. So today I look forward to hearing from our esteemed panel about the radical actions that we need to take in order to end the HIV epidemic over the next 10 years. Time is against us. What is it that we can do to address inequalities in, uh, to end HIV as AIDS and as a public health threat? I also look forward to hearing the voice of our young panelists, who Mr. Anel Mkila, who will share with us the campus tools that uh, can be used by our students in order to graduate alive. So on that note, I'd like to hand over to Professor Ngama, who will facilitate the discussion um, forward. As I mentioned earlier in my introduction, Professor Nama is the Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Health Sciences here at UKZ10. Prof Nama has contributed quite a lot in the fight um, against HIV and AIDS over the, the past few years. She has spent a year at Fogarty Postdoctoral Research Fellow at as, as a uh, Fogarty Postdoctoral Research Fellow at Caprisa. She worked with a group there on the study of HIV AIDS zero incidents among STI attendees. And during that period, she received a grant from the NRF for a project titled Evaluation of HIV Testing Models Utilized in the Prince Cyril Zulu STI Clinic. She is also an NRF C3 rated researcher. She was recognized by our institution as a distinguished teacher in 2007. She has in other countries such as the United Arab Emirates and Seychelles, and she has developed HIV AIDS nursing curricula for use in East Africa. Prof. Nama is currently a member of the Sustainable and Healthy Food Systems Program, an interdisciplinary research program supported by the Wellcome Trust. She is a member of the Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society for Nurses and UCS. UCSF International HIV AIDS Network, just to name a few. She is the previous director of UKZN's World Health Collaborating Center for Community Problem Solving in Nursing and Midwifery in Africa. So Prof. Nama, the virtual stage is yours, sis. It looks as if we have lost Professor Nama. Um, so please give us a minute uh, just to reconnect um, Prof Nama, who will then facilitate the discussion um, going forward. Kim, are you able to reach her? Okay, Prof is uh, connecting again. Let's just give him a second or two. That's the challenge we deal with all the time when and working in virtual spaces. <laughs> Apologies, I'm back. I've been dropped off for no reason. I don't know. Uh, I'm not, not sure a problem, with Prof. With the introductions. Yes, I've done, I've delivered the welcome address and I've introduced you. So now I am handing over to you so that you can then facilitate the proceedings. Um, Thank you, you very can much. switch on your, 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 your video prop so that we can all see you and then you can proceed. Okay. Thank right. you very much. And apologies about what's happened. Uh, sometimes technology lets us down, but uh, at least I'm back. Uh, greetings to all our attendees and greeting a special welcome uh, again from me to all our panelists, uh, Professor um, 
uh, uh, Mafuya and uh, the other panelists. It really is a pleasure today to host all of you uh, on this uh, special day, uh, the World AIDS Day. My name is Busingama, as has uh, been described already. I am a Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of the College of Health Sciences. Uh, today really marks uh, the year 2021 marks 33rd anniversary of the World AIDS Day. It's the longest that has been running since, uh, 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 it's the longest disease uh, um, awareness campaign that has been running with the aim at creating awareness and prevention. So it's the longest in, the, in its kind in the history of public health. The World AIDS Day was first observed in 1988 and has since been initiated by health ministers from around the world who called for a spirit of social tolerance and a greater awareness of HIV and AIDS on an international scale. The theme, as we've heard, the theme of uh, 2021 is inequalities and AIDS. Now entering our third year with COVID-19 pandemic, which has exacerbated the inequalities that we are seeing and disruptions to HIV services, making the lives of many people living with HIV even more challenging. This year's theme addresses this issue by highlighting the growing inequalities in access to HIV treatment and care for the estimated 38 million people which are now known to be living with HIV worldwide. This event is also meant to underscore the importance of awareness of HIV and AIDS and its effects on poor people's lives, our families, friends, local neighborhoods and nations around the globe. It's an important part, uh, it's an important day and an important part of the world's day is that it helps create awareness and education at the local level. So we are really uh, honored to be hosting you today. Uh, we have just discovered that this university uh, by our scientists, the, the Omicron uh, variant of uh, COVID-19, we have seen that the inequalities are becoming widened. Uh, yesterday, we looked also at the fact that uh, unemployment had risen. So these are all the things that we are hoping will be highlighted today the violence against uh, um, uh, women and children, which is also really a, a, a high. All those issues are, are the issues that will be unpacked today. But my task is very simple today. I'm not the one that will be telling you about all of these things. My task is just to facilitate this event and uh, introduce our, our esteemed speakers who will be taking you through uh, some of these uh, 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 lectures. It really is my pleasure to introduce Professor Refilwe Nancy Paswana Mafuya, who is a professor of epidemiology and public health at the University of Johannesburg, Faculty of Health Sciences. I think this year we said we always host uh, uh, this event using our own uh, scientists. It's always good to hear from people who are outside UKZN, and uh, it's our pleasure, really, Prof, to be hosting you. Uh, professor Refilwe Nancy Paswana Mafuya is a professor of public health and epidemiology. She holds a Master of Public Health program, Faculty of Health Sciences at University of Johannesburg. She is an MSc Reproductive Biology and Health Guest Epidemiology Lecturer at Penn African University of Life and Earth Sciences based at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria. Preceding this, she was an active executive director, research director and chief research manager at the HIV and AIDS and STI TP research program, Human Sciences Research Council, that's HSRC, for nearly 13 years, as well as a, a serving as an editor in chief an ex executive director of an internationally accredited journal, Sahara. She's an MA, a South African Medical Research Council mid-career research scientist, a research program holder, which is aimed at building the next generation of current and future pandemic fighters, independent scientists in South Africa. And we really need those because we often hear that we've entered the age of pandemics. She chaired the second largest medical meeting in the world, which is the ninth South African AIDS Conference in June 2019, 
and delivered the Declaration of Commitment to End HIV by 2030 in Cabinet. She's a member of the Dira Singwe Conferences, Higher Health Board, ASAF Council, NRF Board, International Experts Panel um, of Infectiology, representing the African continent, African Academy uh, of Sciences, AAS Fellow, an organization for women in science and developing world uh, a fellow. She's an ASAF and NRF merit scientist. She has been doing large scale, multi-country, multidisciplinary HIV studies for the last two decades. She was awarded the NSTF TW Ngambule Award in 2017 in recognition of her outstanding contribution to science, technology, and mathematics. 15 years after obtaining her PhD. So she has been very long in this journey. She's the former Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation at the Northwest University and an author of the Vision Never Dies book, which was published in 2021. Her vision is to change, transform and impact lives. With this world, it's my pleasure really to welcome you, Prof. The topic that you are going to speak to is um, radical action to end the HIV epidemic by the 2030 deadline. Ladies and gentlemen, I hand over to Professor Nancy Paswana Mafuya. Prof, thank you very much, over to you. Um. Uh, good afternoon, uh, 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 Program Director, um, Deputy Vice Chancellor Nama. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, Executive Directors at uh, the University of KwaZulu Natal, uh, fellow panelists, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for um, the invitation. Um, the 1st of December is a very exciting day, but it is also an emotional day because it's a day on which we remember our loved ones uh, that we have lost through the sketch of uh, this, uh, of HIV and AIDS. But uh, much as it's emotional, the hope has been our pillar and a lot of developments have taken place such that today HIV is no longer a killer disease, but it's a manageable disease uh, that with equitable systems, um, anybody, whether HIV positive or not, uh, can thrive in this life. And thanks to many people, healthcare workers, uh, government departments, political organizations, communities, beneficiaries, scientists that have jointly worked together. Um, having said that, uh, as the theme or the title of my talk says, radical action to end the HIV epidemic by the 2030 uh, deadline, uh, I, I'm gonna be challenging us not to let our guts lose, because if we do, we will fail in stopping uh, uh, this pandemic from being a pandemic, but to being an, a, a manageable disease where we have zero uh, deaths, zero infections, zero stigma, and it becomes like polio and many other diseases that we have overcome over the years. For us to achieve that indeed, we have to go radical. And I, I hope that uh, by the end of my presentation, uh, we will um, be energized, you know, to focus uh, in spite of the competing health priorities that we are faced with, the limited resources where we have to do uh, more with less. So in my presentation, I'll uh, uh, touch on why radical action. Uh, and I'll demonstrate a little bit of facts and figures. Uh, and I'll acknowledge the work being done. I will also uh, highlight 
uh, radical actions that could be taken uh, with regard to addressing inequalities and inequities. And I'll talk also about scaling up of evidence-based interventions. We have the knowledge, we have the information. We just need to make sure that it reaches you know, the people that uh, need it the most. And I'll do some concluding remarks. Why radical action is, is needed? Uh, the war is far from over. Why there is still no cure or vaccine after 40 years of fighting this disease? And South Africa remains the home uh, for the HIV uh, epidemic, the center uh, or epicenter of the epidemic and new infections remain unacceptably high. There are still thousands of deaths that we evidence and there are still people who are not on treatment and we know what it means not to be on treatment. That is death. And there are people who cannot get viral suppressed because they cannot have access uh, to treatment uh, and, and because they have it sporadically or for other reasons that I'll highlight in my presentation, they do not adhere and therefore they become resistant and therefore they become severely ill and then eventually die. And that's, those are things that we'll be looking at. How do we radically address them so that we achieve the most with um, the systems that have been put in place. Facts and figures, uh, as at uh, uh, 2019, uh, it, according to the UNS uh, report, uh, 7.5 million people are living uh, with HIV in South Africa. Um, and uh, the media uh, statistics South Africa 2021 report uh, alludes to an estimate of 7.7 .7, uh, million people living with HIV. So this is a bit uh, dated um, uh, and the prevalence is like about one in uh, five uh, adult people uh, uh, in the ages of uh, 15 to 49 are living with HIV, 200,000 new infection, 72,000 AIDS related deaths and 71% uh, not on ARVs, and 47% uh, of children not on ARVs. And uh, the region, uh, which is also the hardest re hit region given uh, uh, our country and countries like uh, 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 Swaziland and other top five countries that are leading the epidemic in the region, we are still by far the epicenter of the epidemic. And we, we have 20% of all people living with HIV in our region and 20% of new HIV infections are uh, in South Africa. Um, I want to uh, uh, give credit uh, to our South African uh, uh, government and leadership for unparalleled commitment, uh, uh, the legislative framework that we have, the initiatives that have been there, the alignments that have always been made to keep up uh, you know, uh, the response to, to, to the epidemic in spite of competing health priorities again. And we know that it is the Department of Health, not the Department of HIV or not the Department of COVID-19. They do multiple work with limited resources. So while I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we, are, we need to deal with, uh, I, I wanted to clearly acknowledge this because I'm one of those people that were given the latitude to address ministers in cabinet uh, through the uh, facilitation of the deputy president, uh, uh, who is the chairperson of the South African National AIDS Council. And I have had the privilege of listening to them making uh, commitments towards ending uh, the sketch of HIV, and that is really to be applauded. Um, and internationally, uh, uh, legislative framework continue to be put in place in order to make sure that we do not lose direction. And uh, as we know, the UNAIDS has made a political declaration on HIV and AIDS to end inequalities and to get on track to end AIDS by 2030. Uh, and that again is to be uh, uh, applauded because a global commitment, you know, uh, uh, goes, you know, spirals to regional to national uh, commitments. Um, now, we need to push beyond complacency. Uh, we need to address the myth, you know, that uh, HIV is over. 
HIV is no longer a public health emergency, uh, that everyone is well informed, everyone is HIV tested, everyone is on treatment, and everyone adheres to treatment. That is a myth. I'm sure you will agree with me. You've seen the number of deaths we are still experiencing. You've seen the number of you've seen the new infections that we're still experiencing, uh, and people who are not in treatment and so on. Therefore, we cannot let our guts loose. Uh, the response uh, to uh, the HIV pandemic must be guided by who is who is HIV killing in disproportionate numbers, you know, for greater impact, focusing on where the need is most. And Dr. Errol Fields from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine uh, says, there are stark differences in HIV outcomes due to HIV disparities. The racial disparities that so rapidly emerged with COVID-19 are a reminder that until these inequalities or inequities are addressed, disparities in HIV and COVID-19 outcomes will persist and ending the HIV epidemic will remain just a dream that will never come true. So we know some of the social demographics, you know, that uh, serve as dividing line between the risks and uh, 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 achieving of the desired outcomes. And I will allude to them in a moment. What, and this is the question that I'd like us to keep at the back of our minds, what would have happened if HIV cure was available tomorrow? Accessibility and affordability would prevent thousands and thousands of people who need it the most from being able to take that cure right away. We have seen it with uh, uh, COVID-19. We have seen it over decades with HIV and AIDS that inequalities uh, serve as barriers for people to access services you know, uh, and to uh, receive quality services and for us to achieve the kind of coverage we need to have. So health inequalities and inequities serve as barriers to transforming the, you know, our response or to fast tracking, shall I say, uh, our response. You know, for most people living with HIV, uh, uh, they would meet a doctor twice a year, only for 30 minutes. Equitable healthcare access Says, you know, addressing systematic barriers or systemic barriers, uh, uh, you know, and, and ensuring availability and uh, quality and uh, resources, you know, that would transport people to various uh, uh, facilities to access uh, healthcare is quite key. So the topic of celebration of this year's uh, 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 World AIDS Day could not be uh, uh, better. It could not have been better than what it is. Inequalities have been looming around, and I think it's time that we face this head on if we are to meet the 2030 deadline. A high HIV prevalence and new infections uh, among women uh, have been seen. We all know what the distribution is like in South Africa, where uh, women and girls uh, constitute more than 50% uh, of people living with HIV and AIDS. I'm sorry, the, uh, I forgot to put percentage there. And where uh, 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 young girls, uh, adolescent girls and young women uh, have a, an HIV prevalence that is four times higher than that of young men. Uh, and, and by the way, even with young men, uh, uh, it is a, a huge concern. I couldn't cover the statistics, you know, about all this because that is not uh, really the purpose of my presentation. However, uh, suffice to say, young people are uh, 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 impacted very negatively uh, by um, HIV. Now, because we know that uh, the agent that impacts, uh, we need our responses to be also gendered. For example, many women are forced to use their bodies as a currency for food, for medicines, for school, and, and uh, what have you. They are exposed to uh, GBV, as it was alluded to earlier on, gender dynamics in terms of uh, role, cultural roles, and some of the cultural practices that continue to disrespect the dignity of women. 
stigma, stress-induced uh, mental health uh, challenges where they have a lot of responsibility to carry out without the means, being in informal uh, work environments, not having any job security, low income earners, uh, basically they are working and living conditions, being insurmountable for them to lead a, a normal life. And for some, this leads to early sexual debut teenage pregnancy, intergenerational relationships, sexual exploitation, human trafficking, the list is endless. We need to deal with the gendered impacts of HIV and have gendered responses. And those include addressing the issue of poverty, the, the issue of uh, unemployment, the issue of the low status of women, the issue of their working and living conditions, empowering women, empowering young people uh, so that they are not on the street, they are not on drugs, they can manage their lives uh, better. We need to confront unsustainable livelihoods. They increase HIV prevalence, new infections, they deter treatment uptake and adherence. And, and when we talk about radical action, we need to make a clear distinction between structural barriers and individual choices. Uh, if people choose deliberately not to be responsible, that is something else. But here, when we talk about inequalities and inequities, we're talking about people who most of them would love to make choices, but they are uh, uh, hampered from making choices because they don't have the means. For example, rural and marginalized communities face a double epidemic. As South Africans, you know exactly what I mean. Poverty is extreme, inequalities in, in terms of income. You know South Africa is the most unequal country in the world. Now, such people may struggle to take a daily medication while facing food insecurity, while they don't know where they're going to sleep, while uh, 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 they uh, have no means whatsoever. A and some of them can't even go where treatment is. And, and eventually they will never become a viral suppressed and they will never have a better health outcomes and their quality of life will just be uh, uh, destroyed. So these things can affect the ability of people to take uh, 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 you know, or to comply, you know, as we have seen even with uh, COVID-19. So we need to eliminate these disparities and ensure availability, accessibility, and affordability of these services so that we can uh, improve health outcomes and uh, cap the differences along racial lines. We need to protest interventions in more prevalent and socioeconomically worst of uh, environments. Uh, we need to uh, uh, mitigate uh, uh, lack of access uh, and expand un, uh, you know, uh, uh, health care to uninsured patients. So, okay. A pandemic thrive on inequalities. Just a week or so ago, we have seen how Africans uh, are, are, are hospitalized in bigger numbers than other uh, racial groups at a younger age group and how black African females um, uh, uh, are hospitalized far more than their uh, other female uh, counterparts. And the only logical uh, you know, explanation of that uh, you know, is the living and working conditions uh, because these are young uh, 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 Africans who are in the 20 to 29 age category, 30 to 39 age category, where uh, uh, the expectation is that they have lower comorbidities and so on and so on. Uh, 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 why would they have higher rates of hospitalization and even of death? Uh, the, the logical explanation is the inequalities. So as you have seen, COVID-19, a pandemic, HIV, a pandemic, TB, a pandemic, uh, continue to thrive because of uh, inequalities and uh, 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 manifesting uh, in differential impacts depending on the socioeconomic uh, uh, background of people. To transform the course of the epidemic, we need to expand care and prevention strategically to those who need it most, uh, nor uh, Volker says. Um, so what I've tried to do, and I, uh, I am rushing because uh, my time is limited, um, um, I have taken a few of my studies uh, to demonstrate the kind of uh, evidence that we have in our hands 
that we can expand, you know, on scale up successful interventions uh, in order to radically change the, 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 uh, the context as we have it now and end and the epidemic by 2030. First, starting with dealing with inequalities as I have demonstrated. And now I will talk more in terms of the scientific uh, uh, results that we've got and how we can utilize some of these. And I know there are various other works that have been done by other scientists that we should be taking more on in order to respond uh, in an evidence-based manner. Firstly, uh, we need to work collaboratively as a continent, you know, uh, much as we need to work collaboratively as a country not us and them, you know, we can only win if we work together. I shared this study that I did in 10 African countries, being the overall PI with each of the 10 countries having respective principal investigators that, you know, ended up with a book on effective responses to the HIV and AIDS epidemic at work. This showed that collaboratively we can really bring solutions to the African country and their common, I mean, continent, and there are commonalities. Uh, there's knowledge exchange we can uh, benefit from. Uh, so as a point of departure, I want to say, let's not work in silos. Let's work together so that we can multiply uh, our limited efforts with the strengths of others. Um, uh, further, we can scale up community-based approaches. Uh, nothing for us without us. That is what the HIV community uh, says. And here we tested a community-based uh, intervention uh, that sought to ensure early HIV testing, early uh, uh, treatment and retention in care uh, for better outcome. In this case, the primary outcome being viral load suppression. And we found that uh, community-based interventions, like having these uh, interventions in non-clinical settings in order to expand the work that is being done in clinical settings, especially for key populations that are most often discriminated against, stigmatized, and so on, and thus uh, 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 don't uh, feel free to use public services, having alternative places or point of care type environments where they can uh, go for services. Uh, worked in, 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 in ensuring that, uh, you know, they get HIV services uh, timelessly. Um, further, uh, we need to scale up community level combination prevention interventions. Uh, uh, multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity is going to be very key if we are to achieve the 2030 deadline of ending HIV as an epidemic in our country and uh, 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 eventually globally. You can imagine that if South Africa gets it right, given the fact that we are the epicenter of the epidemic, then the world will get it right. So it is really in our hands. And here we found that when we have combination prevention in non-clinical uh, 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 settings, working with uh, beneficiaries, especially high risk group, groups like having biomedical interventions, having uh, condoms, uh, 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 PrEP, uh, behavioral interventions, uh, such as, you know, uh, uh, avoiding multiple uh, sexual partners and, uh, and so on, and, and uh, community level HIV prevention interventions where you are involving those uh, that are the beneficiaries worked. Uh, in reducing HIV acquisition, uh, we followed a, 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 a group of men who have sex with men uh, to look at how many of them or what proportion will serial convert if they are given a package of, of, of interventions that we know condoms uh, and you know colorful condoms, flavored condoms, uh, uh, you know, and messaging and uh, engagement throughout and so on. And we found that. Uh, 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 there were higher levels of uh, 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 non-zero conversion. Uh, so we know what works. Let's scale up what works. Uh, we need to estimate sizes of high-risk populations uh, 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 because that will give us the denominator we are working on and we will be able to measure our impact uh, 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 and monitor 
our indicators. So we have done studies uh, involving mapping population size estimation, as well as uh, assessing uh, uh, risk heterogeneities because, uh, you know, accepting the fact that there are epidemiological heterogeneities in terms of risks of different groups of individuals is quite key because you've got to know your epidemic in order to know your response. So uh, again, continuing in that fashion, in this case, we estimated in Ghana uh, and we also estimated population size in Port Elizabeth and we, we could uh, 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 tell you know, what is the size of men who have sex with men, in, for example, in Port Elizabeth, just like we did in Ghana. This information is critical for policy making, is critical for informing uh, programming, uh, for resource allocation, for prioritization. Uh, uh, such information needs to continue being generated in order to continue making sure that uh, 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 policymakers are informed by science. Uh, we need to scale up non-conventional models of care for populations that are disproportionately affected uh, by HIV so that they can engage uh, in care. For example, here we looked at strategies that could be used to ensure that female sex workers of a, sexual, of a reproductive age access prevention of mother to child care uh, uh, transmission uh, services so that their children are not born HIV positive and also so that they can uh, manage uh, their uh, uh, HIV uh, uh, status so that they do not become uh, 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 severely ill and so on. So, so we've got to acknowledge, you know, the fact that conventional methods of just saying we've got clinics, go and access ARVs, go and uh, get condoms uh, work, but uh, the context within which we are in, uh, uh, where the stigma, there's discrimination, and also there's lack of capacity uh, that we would love to have, and there are no sufficient uh, public health facilities. Some of the people have to go across the river and whatnot, and when the weather does not allow and, and stuff like that, they just cannot access, and they, there's long queues uh, and what have you. We know our struggles as uh, 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 one of the developing countries. It's not uh, a unique situation. Those are realities that we have to deal with in order to deal with the HIV epidemic. Uh, and end it by 2030. We need to harness big heterogeneous data to inform programming. We have lots of work that is being done from different angles, from different corners, from different di disciplines. We need to amass that information. This is the era of the fourth industrial revolution. We need to use uh, 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 machine learning techniques for IR techniques. We need to use uh, uh, technologies uh, uh, and virtual uh, methods, you know, to ensure uh, uh, that uh, we kept the spread of HIV. And in this case, we uh, are beginning a study of, of that similar nature, which is funded by the uh, South African Medical Research Council uh, as part of uh, the SAMRC uh, Medical Research Scientist uh, Capacity Building uh, Program, where many young women uh, and, and, and we are prioritizing previously disadvantaged young people to develop them and ensure they have capacities, you know, to carry the knowledge enterprise forward, uh, to fight pandemics and epidemics. We have that responsibility. And as we have seen for each project, you will see there are interns, there are, uh, uh, you know, there are people of various levels, so as to make sure that we transfer the knowledge as we work in order for the fight, you know, to be carried forward even by the new generation. Uh, and um, as I go towards the concluding uh, remarks, I, I also want to mention, you know, the fact that we need to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 for the continuity and sustainability of healthcare services. Uh, and I must applaud uh, HIV scientists, uh, 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 government again, uh, and many other role players, the, the, the community, HIV communities, for continuing amidst all competing uh, priorities to ensure that uh, these services, uh, you know, are, you know, pick up because we have. Uh, had a dent, uh, uh, not a, a problem of anyone. The world was caught unawares. Uh, COVID-19 caught us unprepared, uh, but what we want to do is to make sure that we don't continue uh, 
uh, to be uh, 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 disadvantaged. We, we, we take our position and provide leadership on this. Uh, we need to implement tailored interventions uh, because we are more and more seeing people who are resistant to HIV-1 regimen. You know, and so we have proposed this study. This has not yet been conducted, and we've requested the World Council to provide resources so that, as part of the generic public health services for individuals that are non viral suppressed, we should do drug testing resistance for HIV 1 regimen and determine if we should rather put them on HIV 2 regimen. The the point is that for us to achieve the 2030 deadline, we need to make sure that when we put people on treatment, uh, people become virally suppressed and then leave. Not to put people on treatment, which is very expensive. I mean, South Africa has the largest HIV program in the world, one. And South Africa is the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to administer uh, uh, pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis. Hence, I have been giving them accolades for, for the commitment uh, they, they have shown. Uh, but it is up to us, you know, in, in terms of making sure that what we are administering is effective. And so that is one of... Uh, the tailored interventions that we uh, uh, will be looking into very, very closely. As I conclude, uh, you know, a clear cut agenda leading uh, uh, to 2030 is desperately needed. We cannot afford to be wishy washy. Uh, we have to be deliberate, we have to be focused, ensure continuity of services, ensure that we focus on groups that are disproportionately affected, ensure that evidence-based interventions are scaled up, ensure that dialogue continues, we don't lose, uh, 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 you know, the, the conferences, HIV conferences as we have had them, they rejuvenate us, we work collaboratively in order to ensure uh, impactful work, we address barriers, especially inequalities, uh, uh, so that we eliminate HIV by 2030. Thank you very much. I wish to acknowledge my postdoc fellow who worked with me, Dr. Edith Palani, is sitting right here by me and my university for having afforded me the opportunity to give uh, this presentation. I thank you very much. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you so much. We highly appreciate um, the, this, uh, um, I mean, great presentation that we've received from you. I just want to say, spoken like a true activist, a true health advocate, we feel you. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks so much, Prof. Uh, Prof has highlighted a number of issues that we should debunk the myth that the HIV pandemic is very well managed. I think we got that message. We know that uh, even though South Africa is having the largest ARV program, the inequalities are very prevalent and there are still people that cannot access treatment as you've highlighted, accessibility, affordability, which goes a, a long way in, in, in managing the scourge of HIV and AIDS. We have a, 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 a put a, a passion plea out there to say that inequalities should be ended. And you've highlighted that they affect women much more than other groups, especially the young, the young women and children. So we need gendered responses. I think I could also identify a lot with that, working in, a, in an institution where we see a lot of young people uh, who, who, and uh, they, 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 they are struggles as women. I, I could really identify with what we see on the ground. We, you've talked about radical action being needed, the special focus on marginalized communities who are struggling to, to sustain their livelihoods, who have no food, no place to stay. Uh, you've made, the, again, another patient uh, plea that uh, sub social economic issues must be addressed and we cannot work in silos. We have to work together. I think that is what for me also resonated very well because most often we think we can do things alone, but doing a little bit there and doing a little bit there, it's not the same as people coming together and confronting issues as a collective. One other thing that you've highlighted, Prof, is the use of technology. 
and uh, I thought of the social media. You know, you've got a whole lot of disinformation campaigns which are running on social media right now. It's the vexers, anti vexers, anti vexers, and you can see the Twitter wars and. Um, I think you were very spot on about saying that we have to be out there as well and take up the space in the social media and um, let science go out there and confront these disinformation campaigns head on, on those spaces. So I just want to thank you very much, Prof, for having shared all your studies that you've conducted. We really applaud the work that you are doing and we are really grateful for everything. Uh, if there are questions, we will deal with them when we deal with the question and answer session. Just put them uh, in, um, on, on the chat box or we will then call for questions and people can raise their hands. Once again, Prof, thanks a lot uh, uh, for gracing us with your presence and, and giving us this wonderful presentation. We will now move over to the next um, panelist who will also be sharing with us the speech about uh, 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 this day as well. Uh, our next panelist is uh, Ms. Refilwe Ning, uh, sorry, uh, it's uh, Ms. Felicita Hikwam. I hope I'm pronouncing correctly Hikwam or Hikwam, I'm not sure. Uh, you, will, you will help me when you start so that I don't, <laughs> I don't mispronounce. Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Felicity Hikwam will talk to us about the last mile, that last stretch addressing the inequality to end AIDS as a public health threat. To just share her, um, to just share her um, a, a bio. Apologies, I just want to get her bio, it has disappeared once again. Um, like I said, um, Prof? Yes, you've got it, you can read it. Yeah, and it, it was included in the invitation. Um, I guess okay. all, we can, yeah, all we can say is that I'm the director of the AIDS and Rights Alliance uh, for Southern Africa, and that I'm speaking to you this afternoon from Vintuk, Namibia. It's really hot here, um, but it's, it's a great honor for me to be able to join you all um, this afternoon uh, to address you on this World AIDS Day and the topic of the last mile addressing inequality to end AIDS as a public health threat. Um, I'll ask for my slides to be, to be shared, please. Yes, um, so while we wait for the first slide to be shared, um, in some way, I feel like my presentation today is a show of gratitude to you, KZN, for the work of your Vice Chancellor, Prof Nana Poku, um, has been doing as part of our board of trustees, um, as well as an operationalization of an MOU or a memorandum of understanding that ARASA has in place with HERD. Um, the previous speaker made a very passionate plea um, for radical action to end the HIV epidemic by the 2030 deadline. And I will now attempt to reinforce and supplement her strong plea for inequality to be addressed in order for us to make strides towards ending AIDS. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, yeah, no, that's fine. Um, the role of inequalities in the distribution and outcome of in infectious diseases has long been recognized. As far back as 1848, Rudolf Virchow, a German pathologist, in his report on the 1848 typhus epidemic, emphasized the economic, social, and cultural factors involved in its etiology and clearly identified the contradictory social forces that prevented any simple solution. Instead of recommending medical changes such as more doctors or hospitals, 
He outlined a revolutionary program of social reconstruction, including full employment, higher wages, the establishment of agricultural cooperatives and universal education. Next slide, please. This sentiment was applied to HIV by Jonathan Mann, the first head of the World Health Organization's Global AIDS Program on AIDS, who is also recognized for having created a new discussion throughout the world's academic uh, community about the nature of illness and health and its relation to isolation and stigmatization and for calling for public health responses to consider human rights dimensions and interventions. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Despite this, inequalities and other structural barriers have not been at the center of the global AIDS response from the outset. As you may remember, messages of early public health slogans claimed that AIDS affects and impacts everyone equally. Contrary to that, we now know that AIDS is not for everyone, and social inequalities have and continue to powerfully sculpt both the distribution of HIV as well as the health outcomes for those affected. Inequality in its various and interwoven forms is in, it, in itself a pathogenic force at the center of the AIDS epidemic and ending AIDS as a public health threat will simply not be possible unless inequality is addressed. This graph um, shows how drastically new HIV infections amongst adults aged 15 to 49 can be reduced by the integration of interventions that enhance legal and policy environments to reduce inequalities amongst others. Next slide, please. Given the aforesaid, um, and also the figures that, my pre that the previous panelists shared, it is really no coincidence that East and Southern Africa remains the region in the world most heavily affected by HIV, accounting for approximately 55% of all people and two thirds of all children living with HIV. Neither is it a coincidence that the majority of those infections were among women and girls or key pop and key populations, um, key and marginalized populations such as sex workers and lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender persons and their partners, which accounted for 32% of new infections in 2020. In 2020. Uh, thank you, next slide, please. Next slide. The recognition that every human being is equal and deserving of dignity is recognized in international treaties such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, regional instruments, um, previous slide, go back one slide. It is recognized in regional instruments such as the African Charter on Human and People's Rights and the Constitution of all countries in Southern and East Africa. As mentioned by the previous speaker, in June and July of 2021, the United Nations member states adopted the global AIDS strategy for 2021 to 2026 and the political declaration on HIV and AIDS, ending inequalities and getting on track to end AIDS by 2030, which recognizes that our failure to adequately address inequalities across multiple forms and dimensions, including those based on HIV status, gender, race, ethnicity, disability, age, income level, education, occupation, geographic disparities, and incarceration, which often overlap and compound each other, have contributed to our failure to reach the 2020 global HIV targets and acknowledge that only by reducing these inequalities can we close the gap for HIV prevention, testing, treatment, and support by 2025 and put our countries back on course to end AIDS by 2030. Next slide, please. The UNAIDS World AIDS Day report, which was released on Monday, zoned in on the role of inequality in the pandemic preparedness and warns that if leaders fail to tackle inequalities, the world could face 7.7 .7 million AIDS-related deaths over the next 10 years. UNAIDS further warns that if the transformative measures needed to end AIDS are not taken, the world will also stay trapped in the COVID-19 crisis and remain dangerously unprepared for pandemics to come. 
In particular, the report acknowledges that the need for human rights-based and gender transformative approaches, which address inequalities, reduce stigma and discrimination, create enabling legal environments and strengthen oversight and accountability is not unique to HIV. Effective pandemic preparedness and response ensures that inequalities do not intensify and prolong pandemics and that pandemics do not exacerbate inequalities. In relation to gender inequality, the report finds that, the report emphasizes that gender inequalities and harmful gender norms heighten risk of acquiring HIV and of experiencing disproportionate economic health and social impacts of pandemics. Um, the report also shares that women and girls face greater socioeconomic impact from, from COVID-19 including job and income losses, um, a growing crisis of unpaid care, teenage pregnancy and maternal mortality. The report cites that during the Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa in 2014 to 2016, it upended livelihoods with women's livelihoods typically taking longer to recover than those of men. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to share with you um, the outcomes of a rapid assessment that we conducted at um, ARASA with the support from UNAIDS. Um, we conducted a virtual and online survey with 163 respondents uh, working with NGOs across Southern and East Africa. Um, and we asked them to reflect on the significance of the inequalities focus of the global aid strategy for East and Southern Africa. As you will see from the following slides, civil society responses to the survey and inputs during the virtual consultation highlighted the fact that gaps in HIV responses lie upon the fault lines of inequality. Next slide, please. In response to the question, how would you describe the state of equality in East and Southern Africa, including during COVID-19, participants mentioned the a lack of equality in income access to education and access to health and SRHR, sexual and reproductive health and rights services, particularly for key and marginalized population. One participant described it as, currently in Southern Africa, we are struggling to attain equality and COVID-19 has taken us 10 steps back. Another stated that Southern Africa is home to the most unequal societies on the planet. Next slide, please. Next slide. On a positive note, however, there was, that's fine, you can keep it. On a positive note, however, there was recognition that COVID-19 has made us pay greater attention to inequality. As one participant noted that it's become clear that inequality can no longer be ignored as was possible pre-COVID-19. Adolescent girls and young women, as well as sex workers were identified as the two groups who are most vulnerable to HIV due to inequalities. Next slide. An interrogation of the level of understanding on the part of decision makers, such as government officials and policymakers, of the links between inequality and HIV was somewhat worrisome, as more than half of the respondents disagreed with the statement that government officials and policymakers have a good understanding of the links between HIV and inequality, of which 37% strongly disagreed. So there's very little faith um, from civil society and NGOs that our governments, our decision makers actually adequately understand the link between inequalities and HIV. Next slide, please. Also worrying was the fact that over 60% of participants disagreed with the statement that policymakers, duty bearers, and other decision makers in their country know which interventions effectively address inequalities linked to HIV, of which 34%, 34.2% strongly disagreed. If we don't know which interventions are effective, how can we identify them and how can we fund them? Slide, um, next slide, please. The respondents had several recommendations for how to effectively address HIV-related inequality, and this is based on experiences that they've had and what they've seen works to address um, inequality, including during COVID-19. And these included, um, as translated from Portuguese, it says, 
increased education and employment opportunities. So those are some of the interventions that work along with allocation of adequate domestic resources for programs that address the needs of adolescent girls and young women, as well as making rapid response funding available to meet the urgent needs of marginalized groups, such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people and homeless people, especially during times of COVID or other pandemics. There was also a call to place people at the center of the HIV and COVID-19 responses and to provide more support for community-led HIV and COVID-19 programs to ensure that these services are available to all who need them and that no one is left behind. Next slide, please. Next slide. taking a while. Um, but after four, yeah, you can go back to the mind the gap slide. Um, after four decades of responding to the AIDS, AIDS pandemic, we know that gaps in the HIV response lie upon the fault lines of inequality, and that inequalities illustrate why the HIV response is working for some people, but not for others, and why people are being left behind. Inequalities are a key reason why the global HIV targets, which were set by the United Nations for 2020 were missed. Um, the very inequalities that underpin stigma discrimination also enhance people's vulnerability to acquire HIV and makes people living with HIV more likely to die of AIDS related illnesses. If we are to end AIDS as a public health threat by 2030, we need not just mind the gap, but we need to fix the gaps. This is not only important for the HIV response, it is also crucial for effective pandemic preparedness and response efforts. The new global AIDS strategy and the political declaration on ending AIDS provide us with a bold new roadmap for doing this. Let us join hands and walk this last mile as we move towards ending AIDS as a public health threat. That is the end of my presentation and I share some sources and references at the end. Um, I've also included a slide with um, our website, our web address, and my email address in case somebody wants to um, get in touch. Um, but, the, but the plea is clear, we need to end inequality in order to move towards ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hakim. Uh, we highly appreciate uh, the presentation. You've again, once again, highlighted the big inequalities that we see. And uh, for myself, who live in South Africa, which is the country that has been identified mm. as the most unequal country in the world, mm. I could clearly identify with mm. you. Mm. Um, you also talked about uh, the SDGs and how difficult it is for countries to reach this. Um, as a result, this also has a ripple effect on ending the pandemic of HIV and AIDS. Mm -hmm. uh, you also touched quite a bit on um, the, the effects on jobs and, mm -hmm. and, and employment. Uh, we've just seen the reports that came out uh, a, a few days ago in South Africa, which also highlighted how uh, unemployment had risen in the country. That you also shared with us the research that you've conducted uh, with the organization where it became very clear that the, the government, people believe that their governments do not fully understand these problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, are, you are questioning how can we then address and fund them uh, mm -hmm. if we do not know uh, what fully what is, if the effective interventions should be. You also highlighted the plight of the LGBTQI communities and how this further marginalizes them. I think uh, we've learned a lot from you. We are very appreciative of having, uh, of uh, about uh, uh, sharing all these lessons that you've learned. I would still like to read your bio because I've now found it uh, before I hand over uh, uh, to the next speaker so that the people are aware really who you are. You spoke a lot about our vice chancellor. We know he's a, a chair of that board and we are very happy about it. Uh, Ms. Felicita Hikwam uh, is a director of the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa, which is ARASA. 
Uh, she's the director of this alliance, uh, which is a regional partnership of civil society organizations, which are working together across 18 countries in Southern and East Africa to promote the rights to bodily autonomy and integrity for gender equality and the realization of sexual and reproductive health and rights. She's passionate about human rights uh, with a keen interest in addressing structural and other challenges that prevent women, girls, and other marginalized people from realizing their rights uh, in full potential. Uh, Ms. Akwa has spent 19 years at national, regional, and international levels in health development, advocacy, communication, as well as influencing health policy, with specific focus on HIV and other sexual and reproductive health and rights. Among others, she has coordinated a global anti-stigma campaign for the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies in Geneva, Switzerland, and has been part of the UNAIDS Collaborating Center for Stigma Reduction, together with the Global Network of People Living with HIV AIDS. As Global Program Manager for the World AIDS Campaign, she facilitated the successful setup of the Africa Regional Program to support advocacy campaigners in the global and south and spearheaded the implementation of an advocacy campaign program in three African countries and the sub-regions of the East, West and uh, Southern Africa. From 2021, she served as an African NGO delegate on the NGO delegation of the UNAIDS Coordinating Board. Ms. Sikwam holds a bachelor's degree in communication uh, arts integrated marketing communications and electronic media from Whitebeck College in the US and a postgraduate diploma in management practice from the Graduate School of Business at the University of Cape Town. She currently serves on the boards of SHRH Africa Trust and Songke Justice and is a member of Civil Society Advisory Group for Community Rights and Gender Department of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. We really thank you for having shared all the knowledge that you have on this subject with us. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can continue posting your questions. I can see that they are being responded to. Uh, one question that I see has been answered was the one that was posted um, by Nkululego. I see Professor responded uh, to that question. Um, yeah, Kululego was asking about, are people with HIV vulnerable to COVID? Prof has responded saying that disruptions in access to treatment protocol can be detrimental to health and well-being among HIV persons. People, with the, people living with HIV and AIDS with immunosuppression do display higher mortality risk due to COVID-19 and multimorbidity. And uh, this has been demonstrated in studies that are quoted by Mizal and SS and Tongo. Uh, there's also a decline in annual number of clients remaining on ART by approximately 4%. And this has been quoted in DHIS 2021. In addition, COVID-19 has interrupted uh, HIV prevention and treatment programs. They are competing priorities and that's difficult to, get to, to, to achieve the targets that are, are set. The case fatality rate has also been higher for HIV infected persons when compared to non HIV infected persons. And that's according to the NICD and Statistics South Africa. So thank you, Prof, for responding to those questions. We will now continue and call upon our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is, is Mr. Anelem Kila, who is a UKZN graduate. Uh, Mr. Anel M. Killer is going to talk to us about campus tools in graduating alive. Yo, this is scary, it's like, <laughs> but uh, we will hear more from him, how to graduate alive from the university. Mr. M. Killer is an honor, has an honors degree in BSc Agriculture from UKZN. He also graduated with a, the YALI program in entrepreneurship and leadership. As a former peer educator, he has also served as deputy chairperson in the peer education program and mentor. He is a firm believer in Ubuntu. Uh, with these words, I would like to hand over to you, Anele, 
please take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Prof. Thank you so much. My name is Anele, as has been mentioned. Um, I'm sitting here, I'm so nervous because wonderful things and great things have been mentioned and big people have already spoken before me, professors and directors, and I'm only just a graduate, you know. I'm reminded of a song that just that says I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody. Um, at this point in time, just not to waste any time, just to get straight to uh, the business of the day. The title that I've been given is a bit of a challenging title. It talks about tools that campuses have um, to assist students to graduate alive. Of course, we understand very well that HIV and AIDS is a problematic disease. Um, and hence it's been labeled and given very interesting um, attributes. And it's been said to be a pandemic as well. Um, in fact, it has gone beyond that because it has claimed so many people and a lot of us um, have, have reference of individuals that have been infected and that have died because of um, AIDS itself. But amazingly so, there has been progress that is very interesting scientifically that have led us to this point. And the previous speakers have alluded a lot to those particular progressions that have been done scientifically um, in terms of ARVs and et cetera. But now I would also like to mention something quickly before I continue with my presentation that says, there is a point in time where a person has been using um, ARVs that they get to, and it's called an undetectable viral load. A point where um, a person who's been taking up those ARVs properly um, has the HIV virus not detectable or undetectable in their system, which simply means they cannot transfer it or they, it's, un, it's intransmissible. The other person that they may be sexually involved with will not be infected if they have unprotected sex with that particular individual. I need to emphasize that because it's very important. I remember when I was younger, I've heard a lot of people who claim that they have been healed by a pastor who has prayed. After the pastor had prayed, they go and do a test of HIV. When they get there, they realize that it's undetectable, only to find that they're actually at this state, the undetectable state of the viral load because they've been taking their tabs or their, their antivirus properly. I need to emphasize that because it's one of those elements um, that have been regarded as a mythical element in our communities and people end up behaving carelessly out of that. And I also need to mention that because it's undetectable, it does not mean that HIV is no longer there. It is there, but it just means right now it's dormant. It's not transferable or transmissible to any other person. Now on campus, we have a lot of things that we do. And um, one of the major things that we do on campus, which is fundamentally why we're there is to study. Um, and secondly, not just to study because we don't study alone, we study with other people. So there's the social aspect as well that is accommodated. So academically, we are trained and developed. That's the intellectual aspect. Um, and socially, we are trained as well because there's a community that we live in. And campuses also have the religious aspect with so many organizations that are involved on campus, political organizations, religious organizations, and et cetera. And one of the organizations that I've been part of, um, that I've been privileged to be part of is an organization by the name CHASU. It's called Campus HIV and AIDS um, Support Unit. This is where students come to. Um, students that have been infected with HIV, students that are new on campus and they, you know, they're just trying to get their, 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 they're just trying to get comfortable in the space as well. And they don't know what to do. This is the place that they normally go to. It's called Chasu. What does Chasu do? Chasu is a space where we expose students to more information, the latest about HIV and AIDS. Um, considering the fact that a lot of people are still struggling to access information. Sometimes even though information is readily available, but students sometimes don't go and look for that information. So here we just make it available readily and we have conversations around subjects as HIV and how, is, how does it infect people, TB as well, how does it infect people and how can it be avoided? How can people be assisted to be more aware of these um, these potential menace or these potential ways of infection. And that's one of the elements, one of the tools that we use. It's, it's these organizations that are on campus. So two things that I'd like to, um, perhaps three. The first one is as well food security. Um, it's a major issue on campus specifically for students. But now lately I hear that um, the, 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 the financial aid has provided students with more funds that they may be able to buy their own food and their own meal better than before. Now, why is that important? Why am I mentioning this? Because, you know, when it comes to HIV, you'd think that sometimes it's just a matter of people are just careless. They, don't, they just don't care. Um, we have enough information as it has been mentioned 
and information is readily available. And I, I, that also falls under the second, second point that I wanted to speak to. It's called intellectual security, where people have information available, but it's not palatable. You know, it's just their adversity. And it's if only intellectuals that are academic can understand and, and interpret it properly, but it has not been it has not been downgraded or rather graded enough or graded enough to be palatable to individuals of the of to a common person in the country itself. And the third one is something that I may call um, moral moral security. We have a serious uh, moral degrader that is problematic um, in at, at this point in time in our society, in our community. And this does not just apply to UKZN or does not only apply to universities, but it also applies to general communities that we come from as well. I don't know whether it's because we are in the 21st century or it's the neoliberal situation that we are faced with where people just want to do as they wish without uh, being responsible. I think we need to get to a point where we start teaching people to be more responsible rather than to be careless in terms of how they live. And I believe that every single platform and every single space and every single parent has got only one intention to teach their children to become better. So on the first one, why is the food security such a major issue? I believe that every single part of our body functions because there are certain nutrients that are contributed to it and they are assisted to function properly. I'm blinking because there are nutrients. I'm speaking because there are nutrients. Every single function in this particular body of mine is, is doing what it has to do because there's enough nutrients that are contributed in all of that. So messages communicated from, from any part of my body to my brain requires enough nutrients. And if the nutrients are less, that's called a deficit. So if people lack food, for instance, I'm just making this bigger than perhaps it should be, or some may think I'm exaggerating, but I'd like you to just follow the train of thought. If people lack food that they have, they have to eat, and that food is supposed to assist them in reasoning certain things through in a certain way and in making them more sober in certain circumstances, then clearly people are going to struggle to be sober and take sober decisions. If people are lacking food or nutrients that is required for them to be able to look at things in a certain way, then clearly that's going to be a problem when they are faced with challenges. And I mean, campus is also a depressing space at so many levels. So one of the major tools that I think is important for us to take note of is food security. We need to ensure that students, in fact, that is done um, in UKZN, specifically in Peter Marisburg. I think the campus clinic has always provided students with meals in case they find themselves within the within the month uh, at a point of struggling um, in terms of getting meals so they can go to campus and get those meals without having to compromise themselves and their morals in trying to get assistance from external entities. Um, these may be males or some females or whoever else that can assist, but with the condition of exploiting the students. So secondly, um, on campus, like I said, we have CHASU. CHASU is one of the tools that could be utilized by students. So students can come to that organization on a regular basis to come and speak to, to the individuals that are part of that organization. The um, CHASU is subdivided into four aspects. We've got a, a women's forum, a men's forum, we've got an LGBTQ forum, and we have a, um, an abstinence forum. And all of these forums are catering for different individuals with different needs and who have different interests as well. It's not a, 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 one, a one fits all type of situation. So you can come there and you can pick and choose wherever you'd like to be. We do not force people to become whatever they don't want to be, but we assist people in discovering themselves and, and becoming who they'd like to be. Um, one of our greatest motto that we have on campus as CHASU is, um, it's not practice makes perfect, but it's perfect practice makes perfection. Whatever you do, do it to the best of your ability so that you can become the best in whatever that you are doing. That is the motto that we have and our major interest is in the relational aspect of the students because we understand that students do not only struggle um, from the families that they come from, but they also continue to struggle on campus itself. And we don't only end there, but we stretch our arms and our wings to reach out to other assistive elements that are on campus. So if a student comes to us, we can send them to or refer them to wherever they may receive the type of assistance that we have. We also deal with students that maybe have been raped, um, that have, may have been abused in any way apart from sexual abuse, as well, we, they come to us and we refer them to where they should be referred to. We assist not just students also, we also help individuals, uh, rather we don't only assist students that are South African, we also assist students that are international students that come to campus. And I think this is very important for us to take note of because sometimes some people feel neglected and they don't know where to go to. And I think this is one platform that we could utilize in communicating these elements. We also have a lot of arguments, um, rather not arguments, we also have a lot of discussions around equity, 
um, gender-based violence and et cetera, just to let students know and sensitize them towards these matters. Because sometimes, depending on where you come from, there are times where you think these things do not affect you or they're not as important or they're just being made a big deal of and yet they don't affect you as an individual. But when you come to us, you realize that it's actually more um, something that is personal even to you as an individual rather than what you think it is. So I'll end with just four things. Um, that are quite critical. And I think it's something that every individual should have for them to become a more matured person, which is what we stand for in Chasu, assisting students to become more matured than what they are already. So the first thing is the mental aspect. The mental aspect is an aspect that is assisted um, academically through information that may also be um, through videos, through music, through whatever that you read. Um, the second aspect is the physical aspect. An individual needs to be matured in the mental and also in the physical aspect. And the physical is assisted, of course, through the food that you eat and also through how you take care of that particular body. And the third element I'd like to communicate or speak of is the spiritual aspect. Every single individual has got an inclination of, of worship. And I think if, if we could look at that aspect perhaps a little bit differently as liberals and neoliberals as well, we'll realize that it has played quite a major role in helping and assisting students in going through um, the varsity itself, because varsity is quite a depressing space and it has a lot of pressure on each and every one of us as students. And the fourth one um, is the social space. A lot of us have struggled because of the type of relationships and the people that we surround ourselves with. So these are the four elements that the campus can avail to us. And at the same time, these are the four elements in which we can be attacked the most in the same space um, called campus. And with that, I would like to say, let's continue to work as hard as we can in preventing more infections of HIV and AIDS. Let's uh, uh, um, work as hard as we can as students as well in, in, in fighting against the temptations that may lead us to that, to that point. Um, and that may be referred to as immorality. There's a lot more that I would have loved to say, uh, but because of time, let me end right there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Anele. Hey, you are a professor yourself. Don't worry. The way that you talked, I'm so inspired. I mean, oh, as I'm, as I'm listening here. Well done, uh, 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 Mr. Mtila. You've shared with us quite a lot of um, about uh, the work that CHASU is doing uh, on campus to make sure that students, uh, uh, um, they, 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 they stay alive. You've also uh, uh, reiterated the call for activism around HIV and AIDS and to stop these inequalities that we see all over. And you've talked about that the fact that there are also a number of other organizations on campus which are trying to, to, to achieve the same things that you are, uh, HRC is doing. And we do need to expose students uh, to, to information about HIV AIDS. You touched on two aspects that really I could um, identify with this food security issue. Uh, on campus. Uh, I must say Professor Modi in Peter Meritzberg has worked very hard under the direction of our, our vice chancellor to address this by giving food parcels. The long-term goal though is to provide at least one meal for every student on campus, one healthy meal. As you've talked so much about the, uh, the reason why we should have uh, good food and eat healthily. So that would be the long-term goal, but we also want to pay tribute to organizations like the Gift of the Givers, um, some retailers like I think Pick and Pay, Woolworths and a number of others who have uh, partnered with the university to achieve this uh, under Professor Modi's direction. Uh, we, also know, uh, uh, we also want to thank our vice chancellor because on campus he has really realized that students need good campus health services. And he has raised so much funds. He raised 10 million rands to buy medicines, um, make sure that the students have got to the morning after pill, uh, make sure that there are um, condoms. Uh, we've got all the essential medicines that we should be having in the clinics. But that's not the only thing. He also raised 30 million rands to revamp all the campus health clinics. I hope next year the delays are with the IPP, you know, this tender, how the things with tenders work. But I'm really hopeful that by next year, we would have state-of-the-art facilities on campus. And we really applaud him for take, having taken this uh, uh, very seriously. 
there are still a lot of challenges around staffing and other issues, but we hope we will get there. So I really want to thank you a lot and uh, thank Chasu and uh, the unit that Eleanor uh, leads, which has worked very hard as well to try and provide testing uh, uh, services. Uh, but what we want to achieve now, we want to initiate more students on ARVs. I, I think for me, that's an area that has not been, um, where we have not achieved as we can. So having said that, we, we are glad to announce that we have partnered with some organization like a, a number of NGOs like HST and uh, others who have come forward and said they will assist us. So I'm hoping when students are back on campus, we will have all this uh, uh, operating across our five campuses and we can initiate more students on uh, ARV so that we end this inequities to access and affordability. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amele. Uh, I think we will now look at the questions where there are questions and um, let me see uh, if there are any questions that I can see. Uh, they, they seem to have been answered. Yes, and yes, Prof. Magula is. No, I, I wanted to say there are no questions. We've been monitoring. Yes, they've been answered. Yeah. Uh, Prof. Magula was great, saying great present, presentation, uh, asking, uh, yeah, thank you. I'll be in touch. Uh, yeah, there are no questions. So we really want to thank all our speakers and presenters for the great work that they've done. I think it's important as you've all highlighted that we don't lose this activism that we had earlier on when the HIV and AIDS started. And with the COVID-19, we know that uh, the lockdowns have been terrible in terms of restricting uh, and dis disrupting HIV testing in many countries, uh, which has led to the drops in diagnosis and referrals. We know they were necessary, but they have also uh, uh, really widened the gap as, we, uh, as we've had. With these words, then I would like to thank everybody that was involved in organizing uh, the, the panelists, thank uh, the unit that is headed by Eleanor for having, um, you know, they've been very consistent in hosting uh, this um, World AIDS Day. They've made sure that as a university, we host this World AIDS Day every year. Thank you, Eleanor, and your team. And thank you uh, to Norma's team and uh, Hazel. I've worked closely with you also in getting the uh, vaccinations across campus. Thank you very much. And uh, with all these words, I would like to end today's sessions. And uh, do look after yourselves. Let's push the vaccination. Omicron is here. Please, let's all vaccinate before the holidays. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Um, Musa, you can upload the t-shirts, the, the pics with the t-shirts. Okay, this is nice t-shirts. I'm sorry we can't physically see the t-shirt, but thank you very much for the t-shirt. It is a, a nice t-shirt. We would also uh, um, uh, 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 have lit a candle if we had um, if we were together, but um, I don't know. Elia, no, we had not. A, we have not a, a organized anything along those. So we just want to thank everybody for having come. Thank you so much, Prof. Mama, for driving and running this uh, webinar in such a professional manner. Small call. Apologies about technology issues, but I think we, 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 we've been able to stay on. Let me see. It looks like there may be some chats, more chats. No, there's nothing else. People are just saying thank you. So.
Dr. Swana, thank you, my Fuya, thank you so, so much for joining mm -hmm. us. We really appreciate thank you. Um, Ms. Felicitia, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Also, uh, to Anela and Ms. Felicita. Um, I think it was wonderful. And thank you, everybody that have made it a success. Thank you. Thank you very much for blessing, for, oh, I mean, for, for gracing us with your presence. Really, we appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I see a very positive comments from participants. I'm just monitoring the chat. Uh, the, the participants are very uh, inspired. Thank you so much. Thank if you. we call on you again, I hope you will be available. <laughs> Thank you very much, colleagues. We can lock off now. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much.